the next few years, I mean, a few weeks, uh, some of these activities will come to fruition. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wanderson. Uh, I'll come back to some of the points you raised. Uh, but for now, I'll carry on uh, with the next presentation. Uh, that will be Professor Goski Alabi. Uh, she is uh, coordinating the open distance and online education. Uh, uh, Prof. Goski, can we see you? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I see you now. Hi. Yes. Hello, good morning, and it's a joy to see you all and congratulations once again to the team. And so I am supposed to be presenting on ODL um, on the continent and looking through the CISA document, I noted that our, um, our um, cluster relates to the strategic objective three of CISA and the principle number two. And so all that we do is kind of tied in and aligned with this two. Um, I would jump um, this once and to talk about the current situation of ODL in Africa. After the last two years of the pandemic, there were quite a number of lessons that were learned. And the two most important lesson is that indeed, Africa is resilient when it comes to open and distance education. Quite a number of our institutions had to be closed down for a number of time, for a period of time, but almost um, many of them were able to move on to um, distance learning or some form of virtual engagements. And that was something we thought could not be done but it was done despite all the challenges. So that is good for us. The second lesson that was learned is that many of our faculty, administrators and students, more than 70% of them from a survey that we did are willing to embrace and accept and work with ODL, particularly the EL. But then many of our institutions at the moment are still doing the traditional mode of distance education, which is or has not yet integrated into them e-learning um, systems. We also noted that there isn't any um, database, special database on institutions offering open and distance education, except for those who are registered with the ACDE. And we could count about 10 institutions that um, are at the moment, um, 10 countries that at the moment have open universities in nine countries. So the question we ask is, what about the 45 countries without open universities? We also noted that for those without open universities, they have the um, traditional distance education as part of their educational systems. So many of the universities do have, but they are still running on the traditional mood of um, distance education and not really having e-learning integrated into them. Um, we also learned that the students actually prefer to have blended learning in these institutions from the survey that was conducted. And the reason is that they feel that the um, e-learning brings in some kind of quality and allows them to know what is happening earlier on in their courses and their programs. However, they still see the social aspects of things that we had had to do with how do we build on on the um, gains that were made do, during the active phase of the pandemic. So the issues are scalability, infrastructure. Afran is doing a lot through the, um, its um, um, different sub-regional networks, but then we need to look at how we scale up the end runs for technology 
infrastructure to enable us to transition into e-learning more effectively. This also requires a lot of investment from governments and um, quite a number of the funding institutions may want to start looking at investing on um, EL in Africa. Another issue, critical issue that came up had to do with the quality and relevance. And in this respect, we're looking at the instructional and learning designs. We're looking at adapting curriculum to suit e-learning systems. And we are also looking at capacity building of teachers, faculty, and administrators, and in particular, preparing our students to know how to learn online or virtually, or how to engage in um, e-learning. But one thing that I have not put here has to do with our um, doctoral programs, particularly the funded ones, like- Dr. The Broski, uh, I, I, okay. I- 30 Dr. minutes, Broski. 30 seconds. Okay. Yes. So these are the key issues. And so um, the way forward would be for us to look at having a reporting template that would allow the subclusters to report on their achievements and status. We also need to look at the national governments to work with them to develop e-learning into the um, learning management systems in their country for quality the acde quality toolkit could be relied upon and we intend to work with um, national regulatory bodies in this regard we need a strong advocacy to drive the potential of odl in africa thank you very much <clears throat> thank you very much uh Gorski. sorry for uh, pushing you uh, to complete on time. Uh, yes, now I will be calling upon uh, mm -hmm. Professor Lubomiro Jagede uh, 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 to speak on public private partnership and entrepreneurship as its coordinator. But at this stage, I wish to uh, indicate to the audience that Professor Jagede was a former uh, executive secretary general of the Association of African Universities. Prof, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and, and I'm really pleased to be part of this meeting. I want to congratulate uh, Professor Iwale for his uh, new position, and particularly for uh, convening attending this major meeting of, uh, of CESA. Uh, and I also want to uh, uh, commend my friend, Dan Chu, for his doggedness in making sure that higher education in Africa assumes the, uh, the number one position. I also want to use this, this time to, to thank all of you who uh, uh, commiserated with me as well as even sent me uh, condolence messages on the passing on of, uh, and the burial of my, my mother, which took place just uh, uh, two weeks ago. I want to thank everybody. But let me, let me now go straight to uh, our our subcluster, which is the uh, the public-private partnerships and entrepreneurship subculture, but uh, let me let me start with a rider, and uh, I, I don't want to sound uh, uh, despondent about what 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 is happening on the African continent. We seem to pay a lot of lip lip, lip service to many things, and Caesar is is one of one of them. Caesar is for, as far as I understand it, is for between 2016 and 2025. We are now in 2022, just three years to go. And all we are saying is just lip service. We, we are not getting the support, and I'm going to go into that in, in, uh, when I'm talking, when, when I, I go to some part of my presentation. The public-private partnerships are being regarded as the key towards one of the best ways of achieving sustainable economic growth and eradicating poverty in, in developing economies, particularly of Africa. It has been shown in the developed economy of the world that uh, public-private partnership increases net investment in any specific area of development. And that's why doing it via education is the most potent way of doing it. 
Uh, and so the reason deter uh, for the PPP and E include the lack of sufficient investment in Africa, growing pressures on and the dwindling availability of government budgets. They need to increase focus on service provisions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the last time we, we had the meeting, I think I, I, I spoke about the objectives. We have nine objectives for the subcluster, and we are particularly focusing on two now. One is to suggest ways and means of including in higher education curriculum across Africa, the development of skills and knowledge about uh, private-public partnership or public-private partnerships and entrepreneurship. The second objective we are pursuing now is to direct attention to research and innovation that will enhance the sustainability of uh, PPP and E in Africa. Um, I'm glad that um, uh, the Secretary General also talked about research in his own subcluster. So we, we, I'm glad that we can network on, on research area. The work of a subcluster should lead to the promotion of policy dialogues and ultimately to the production of a policy and guidelines that will provide a continental platform and framework for the development of a public-private partnership for social and economic transformation in Africa. What we are working towards now, two, like I said, in those two things, is one, to carry out a survey on the areas, the specific areas that universities will require to support entrepreneurship being included in the curriculum in all the universities in Africa. The second is to speak with and conduct a survey amongst all the, uh, all the private uh, uh, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs around Africa, and particularly picking the major ones, and as well as the SMEs, to find out what they actually require to make sure that the universities pro produce the pro uh, will have the products that they actually require in their PPE. So that's where we are going. But let me now uh, uh, conclude with one or two words about what I'm saying, about why we are not really moving on. Every subcluster has got its own budget. I'm yet to believe or hear that the African Union or whoever is supposed to be supporting or funding us has sent money to this subcluster. Everybody is just scratching to do something from wherever they are getting the money. I don't think this is good enough for Africa. I'm sorry to be saying this at this point, but we now have to heal the nail on the head. If we are really serious, we have to put our money where our pocket is. If we really think that CESA is important, if AU believes that this is the bedrock of development in Africa, they need to put their money where their mouth is. We need to really support it. We, we have not been able to do much. What, what I have been doing has come from my own personal pocket. And I don't think that is the way to go. Unless maybe I don't know where to get the money or who to apply to, I need to be directed. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Prof. Jagede, for that frank assessment of the situation. I think one of the reasons why we are actually having this conversation is actually to try to address some of these issues. Uh, uh, the challenge we have uh, uh, since since uh, CISA has been on the ground. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll take this. Uh, uh, concern to the to, to authorities. Uh, the sec the next person who would be talking to us uh, would be Dr. Saba Bokhari of uh, UNESCO uh, on ICT libraries and university networking. Uh, do I see her in, in the audience, uh, uh, Dr. Saba? Okay. Uh, if not, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm here. I've uh, yes, very you. good, very good. Uh, I'm just putting up my presentation. We can't hear you though yet. Uh, because I'm trying to, I'm trying to upload my presentation. We barely hear you. Try to. Us. Yes. yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, it seems that I'm not allowed to. Uh, has my has is my video showing? Is my presentation showing? Not yet. Uh, your voice is, is so weak. Uh, oh may, uh, your, your presentation you is coming. Now? Wait, we you see the me? presentation. Okay, great. So, uh, Chair, I'll basically be talking, greetings to everyone. I'll basically be talking about what we've done over the past one year uh, since COVID. Just a and minute, just... Uh, doc, just a minute, Saba. Uh, your voice is still pretty low. Is it better now? Uh, 
Barely. Oh, Barely. Oh, I don't know why. I, I'm, my volume is totally okay. high. Is, is better? Is it better? Okay, carry on. Carry on. Okay, teacher, I'll basically be talking about our work in, uh, in, uh, in the Eastern Africa region on the uh, higher education response to COVID-19 and the future of higher uh, learning uh, in, uh, in the future of higher learning. And then, of, of course, you asked me to talk about I, uh, our um, libraries, uh, digital libraries, and then I'll just um, quickly make a point on the World Higher Education Conference due in May 2022. Okay, so basically, we uh, uh, I, I, we commissioned some studies, some reports on uh, on the higher education response to COVID nineteen in the Eastern Africa region, and uh, uh, and so the one, one of our invitees was the IUCEA, the Inter University Council for Eastern Africa, and uh, they they're responsible for five countries. Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and uh, and South Sudan. And uh, coincidentally, just in 2019, they had held a high-level meeting on uh, on the uh, uh, entitled "Effectively Leading Universities in the Context of ICT and Digitalization of Higher Education in East Africa." And what uh, and the whole objective was to move from theory to practice and adopt uh, the adoption of technology in higher education, the linkages of higher education with industry, the transformative technologies for deep deep learning and they wanted to have a more holistic uh, approach to student development and to ensure resilience in education systems and then of course COVID-19 hit and everyone realized that ed education had come to a standstill in most countries of the world including Africa so uh, then we commissioned this report and uh, Djibouti for example is one of the six countries we'd invited to to do a study uh, can you hear me chair Okay. Yes. Great. Good. Good. So uh, for, for them, I think the most, they, they basically stayed open. They've just got one major university. It's a very small country. And um, their ba major concern was that they realized that uh, their education, their national health system was not was not uh, uh, designed to respond to a pandemic such as COVID-19. And so they decided that they needed more qualified people. Uh, they, they, they realized that their qualified personnel were insufficient, particularly in new technologies and medical biotechnologies and the University of Djibouti decided to, to, to focus their attention on training senior technicians and capable of mastering the concepts and techniques of analysis in the field of medical technology. And so one of the highlights of, the, of uh, COVID-19 for them was to, to uh, open a program called Masters in Biotechnology and uh, Biology and Biotechnology with the intention and to get all their research institutions uh, geared to work towards how they would respond to a pandemic in the future. And I think they finally understood due to COVID-19 that you can't go it alone. And therefore, for the first time, they decided to, to have the engineering department, the medical department and research come together, all three institutes come together to uh, put together this program and, and, and vow to do research in this area in the future. Then we had Ethiopia. Uh, Professor Wanderson is, is here with us today and he made a very good presentation too. And uh, so his uh, findings were basically that uh, that education was deeply affected. Can you put it in a view mode, please? Yeah, I will. Okay, there we go. Is it showing in the view mode now? Oh gosh. Carry on, it's coming. Okay. Okay, and um, basically that, uh, that 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 higher education had basically come to a standstill, and uh, uh, and they required definitely required more quality research in, in future. There was a need to uh, strengthen cooperation within higher education, and especially between policymakers and the higher education sector, and uh, and. And, and I think continuously they, they talked about how that link needed to ma be made, the dialogue between government and higher education sector, which means it wasn't really happening prior to that because they, he kept insisting that, the, that there was that need, the need to develop uh, uh, co confidence between the institutions and government uh, so that to ensure that they, that they survival and continuity in the future, government would also need to provide an inch, uh, additional support financial, financially to higher education to strengthen their, the uh, institutions and institutional uh, approach is what they required for consistent 
support financially and otherwise. And uh, basically, I would say they require capacity building in every area. And, Saba, uh, I, I, you, you have to wrap up now. Okay. So I think I'll just basically uh, share this with you. The publication has just come out. I'll share that with you. And uh, let me just go quickly to the uh, digital technology uh, libraries. We've, supp we've supplied libraries, digital libraries to Comoros, Kenya, Madagascar, Seychelles, South Sudan, Uganda. And I've given you the link for those who want to contact this institution. Uh, they're based in the United States. And then, of course, I'm going to also in, uh, sh share with you links uh, for for the conversations that you, uh, conversation uh, sessions that UNESCO is having uh, leading uh, between now and between January and May uh, leading up to the World Higher Education Conference in Barcelona. So I'll share that with all of you uh, right after this. Thank you, Chair. Over. Thank you very much, Saba. Uh, now I call upon uh, Dr. Shanmin Pellet uh, from University of Namibia. Curriculum, Teaching and Learning. Uh, Dr. Villette, the floor is yours. And before that, Dantu, I just yes. need to inform yes. you that UNESCO is ready to make a presentation on at this convention, if you will give them room to make their contribution, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's uh, keep that. Uh, is it uh, Saba who's going to present? Uh, Saba, is that you who's presenting? No, no I can from, that. that sounds like Salifu. Salifu, okay. Salifu let's, let, let's keep to the end and uh, we'll give them a, a brief moment to share that with us. Thank you, uh, Professor Oyewale. Uh, Dr. Villette? Do we thank see you, the... thank you, Prof. Dampe, and um, greetings to everyone that's attending this meeting. Um, and I feel very honored to do a short presentation to you as the coordinator for um, the subcluster on curriculum, learning and teaching. Um, I'm going to be speaking from my notes. So uh, I just yeah, want to say that African higher education has long been a subject of criticism on the matters of curriculum, program, pedagogical approaches and epistemological cultures. Um, and since uh, the dawn of post-colonial uh, era, the African scholars have expressed that African universities should mirror African societies and cultures by Africanizing the university and its curricula. However, the transformation of African higher education institutions and their curricula to reflect African society and culture in curricular teaching and learning um, remains elusive. Now, many reasons have been offered um, for this, uh, and, and I, I'm not going to delve into that because that's, that's a discussion on its own. But as we know and understand, curriculum operationalizes the academic plan for learning and teaching. And um, it being at the center of the uh, university's educational efforts, it is often, uh, or it often becomes the locus of the sharpest controversies as it deals with questions of what knowledge is of the most worth, what um, knowledge should be introduced to our students, what is it that is valuable for the student as a person and as a member of the community. And particularly, um, if we look at our global interdependence on issues around climate change, environmental sustainability, global pandemics and growing social and economic inequalities and injustices, our higher education institutions are now all the more confronted with how is it responding to these issues. So um, uh, in this context, many African scholars have been arguing that we are in need of a, of a deep, a very deep and broad transformation project with regards to uh, higher education, and that somehow this project needs to explore what is that transformative philosophy and approach to curriculum planning, to curriculum development, to implementation, to thought, to practice across the university that will really help us to uh, get students who will develop competencies that will withstand the waves of change 
uh, and particularly, you know, in this global world. So it is something that we need to continue to wrestle with and to figure out how are we going to do this? What is going to be our guiding fundamental philosophical approach in this uh, uh, area? And you often hear people talk about transformation and transformative approaches and transformation of higher education. But what does this really mean? In, uh, in our context and what kind of an education will really bring about that kind of uh, uh, transformation that we are thinking about and how can we all guide the sector to actually do that. Having said that, um, we have come, uh, we've started on, on a book in curriculum uh, uh, teaching and learning to help us understand what is happening within higher education institutions around these issues that are so fundamental to what it means to be a higher education institution. And uh, up to now, we have, um, uh, the book will obviously, will, cons uh, will uh, consist of 11 chapters. And we have um, seven chapters that have uh, been committed authors that have committed to the writing of these. Um, so far, we've received uh, five chapters um, that we, that's under review right now. Um, two are in the process of, of uh, being um, drafted. Uh, but there are three chapters that we are really struggling uh, to find authors. And we really feel that this book will not be complete without really um, having uh, uh, authors for this uh, for these three chapters, maybe I can just name them. And I would really like to think that there are people um, in this audience that might want to work with us on those chapters, or that may know uh, in their networks people that will uh, be able to um, work in the drafting of these chapters. Um, Dr. Villet, uh, may you please wrap up? Thank you. Yeah, the first one is the chapter on knowledge co-creation, application and learning, a humanistic approach. We need people who can commit to that. We also need people that can help us with um, the chapter on the stakeholders in curriculum development, and then another chapter on transformation, reimagination and learning to learn. So if there are people out there, please do contact me. I would be very happy to uh, get in contact with people who can work with us on those chapters. So thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine, <laughs> very much. Uh, the next presentation, I haven't seen him yet, uh, is uh, Dr. Ronald Bisasso, Associate Professor at the University of Makerere uh, on internationalization and diaspora mobilization. Do I see Dr. Bisasso here? Yes, thank you, Dam you. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will uh, just speak to a couple of notes that uh, we have made. Uh, internationalization and diaspora mobilization were initially two separate subclusters, but were combined after our interaction in 2017 in Addis Ababa, that was in December. Uh, we are a group of uh, five, one of whom has uh, again dropped off because of a new assignment elsewhere. And um, wh what we have done over the years is to reflect on the areas of research uh, on internationalization, uh, paying close attention to the fact that there is a drift towards internationalization at home. And uh, this has been driven by the need uh, for having uh, more employable uh, graduates coming through the systems. But also there is this whole notion of uh, global citizenship that we need to inculcate among our students. Uh, two, we also uh, looked at strategy development, uh, pretty much exploring strategic profiling uh, at, of internationalization at both national and uh, institutional levels. And, and this has uh, some glaring patterns that uh, we, we, we really see replicated 
where we do not see so many institutions with internationalization strategies, but only mentions within their uh, strategic plans. And last but not least was the area of practice where we start questioning uh, the role of uh, international offices and in, in terms of driving the agenda of internationalization. The, the, the preliminary findings indicate that uh, uh, these uh, uh, people who mind these offices are actually more focused on uh, international students coming in and, uh, and possibly the institutions also sending students abroad. But, but this is diminishing, of course, as we all know, with the advent of uh, COVID-19, but also with the strengthening of uh, uh, institutions, both in the neighborhood and far. And, and so this pretty much now creates a challenge of rethinking the roles of these uh, uh, units and the people who should be employed and, and which institutions can now reach the level of even creating for instance, an office of the DVC uh, in charge of international affairs on the continent. Where do we see uh, this uh, going uh, in the next couple of years? That said, going forward, our thoughts have been to really go further and explore uh, the, the role of faculty. Uh, in internationalization at home, because most faculty have had the opportunity of studying abroad. And, and so do, do we still need to overemphasize student mobility when we have faculty who have studied abroad? What role do they bring on the table to internationalize the curriculum, to internationalize research, to internationalize uh, even engagement? And we are also paying attention to deployment of technologies during now this time where we call for resilience uh, to maximize diaspora engagement. We have seen a great number of webinars. We have seen uh, e-classes. We have seen e-meetings, for instance, uh, like this one. In 2017, we met in Addis Ababa physically and there was all this cost, but now we can have a conversation. So we are beginning to ask ourselves, can we structure this uh, very systematically and uh, pay attention to the exploitation or maximization of uh, this potential? And uh, we are also uh, paying close attention at preliminary stage on the internationalization of, of knowledge that is generated in Africa. Uh, how, how can it be brought together even within our spaces? Uh, so, so if I'm working on say internationalization, what is the conversation in uh, at Sababa? Then I'll go for Prof Tamrat or uh, in South Africa, I'll go for other colleagues in there. And uh, we need also to document carefully and analyze quite deeply the success stories of uh, the diaspora uh, especially in higher education development as a whole. Dr. Bisasso, I want you and, to wrap up. Uh, finally, we are reflecting uh, more concretely on uh, growing the scholarship on internationalization by having uh, a couple of uh, doctoral students researching on, on this phenomenon so that we can now have a special issue, for instance, in the International Journal of African Higher Education. I, I beg to stop here and thank you very much, Damtao. Thank you very much, Ronald. Appreciate for that succinct, uh, that succinct uh, comment. Uh, now uh, I call upon Professor Ibrahim Oanda. Uh, I, I I haven't seen him in the in this. I'm crowd. here. I'm here. Don't Perfect. Me. Yes, uh, I'm sure you are connecting from the car. Uh, yes. Scholarly publishing and knowledge uh, dissemination. Uh, Ibra Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dr. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. I'm speaking from Dakar, Senegal. Uh, I am coordinating uh, the work on scholarly publishing and the knowledge dissemination in Africa. Uh, we started this rate uh, last year. Uh, we have been able to sign six authors uh, to do this work. Uh, and uh, we have tried to get two colleagues from the diaspora uh, to join this effort. Uh, and uh, we have uh, two topics that are depending. And, and, and which we are still struggling to 
uh, find others to, uh, you know, to, uh, to ride the chapters. Uh, kind of struggling to strike a good balance between uh, regions, uh, this being a pan African effort, and, and, and also gender. It has been disappointing that, uh, you know, the two female colleagues that uh, we first signed to the assignment dropped out, and uh, I'm struggling to uh, include other two. Uh, in terms of the actual focus of the work, uh, when we discuss about issues of higher education in Africa, there is a sense in which uh, academic publishing and knowledge dissemination is treated as an appendage. Uh, we can discuss about issues of curriculum, access and- Recording outside. stopped. But we don't seem to uh, recording in progress. We don't seem to uh, to appreciate the fact that uh, you know scholarly publishing and knowledge dissemination uh, is the is the engine is the fulcrum uh, that uh, you know kind of gives us the sort of sovereignty uh, that we need to put our imprint in terms of international uh, knowledge uh, production and dissemination engagements. So we have kind of agreed in this uh, you know, uh, work uh, to focus on three phases in which we can discuss knowledge, I mean, uh, academic publishing and knowledge dissemination in Africa. The first phase is uh, the, uh, the immediate post-independence period in Africa uh, that we see efforts in terms of indigenizing uh, publication uh, houses. Uh, the establishment of uh, university places in the continent. Uh, a lot of effort, especially in, uh, in higher education, uh, being expended on, uh, on, on Africanizing content, especially in the humanities and all that. Uh, what is uh, you know, currently emerging from South Africa as polarization. Much of this was achieved in most of Africa uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. The second phase we are this, uh, what we we'll focus on is what we see happening uh, post-1990 in the continent uh, when aspects of repolarization uh, and privatization lead to the corrupts of universe places uh, and the re-establishment of multinationals, uh, publishing companies, uh, coming back from multinationals in the continent. Uh, but more sadly, uh, the corrupts of universe presses and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and almost the emergence of small scale indigenous publishing houses throughout the continent. Nyota uh, Yamukuki in Dar Salaam is the best example of this kind of development. And uh, we see this in terms of the challenges of the divining uh, what, uh, who decides uh, what, uh, you know, academic publishing the content for academic publishing the continent is, and the who decides on what the ecosystem for knowledge uh, production and examination is uh, in the continent. And these are the challenges that we see, uh, you know, happening in the continent. In the two decades, 1990 to around 2000, 2010, we see these challenges coming, uh, coming in. The last uh, phase in which we try to uh, engage with this effort is to see what is happening Currently, the post 2000 period with the digital transformations, uh, the discussions about open access, uh, the beginning of individual academic efforts at publication in the continent. Ibrahim, uh, yes. Ibrahim I want yes. you to wrap up. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and what this means to, to the kind of knowledge uh, that is being produced in the continent. Of course, part of the challenge that we are seeing is the emergence of new regulatory teams uh, that try to, uh, you know, uh, repo everything coming out of Africa's territory. That has its own challenges. But we also have to do with the challenge of how we can reestablish the ecosystems for knowledge, for academic publishing and knowledge production back to higher education institutions of the continent. Now, for us in this, uh, you know, work, the question that we are constantly asking ourselves is, what does academic publishing and the knowledge dissemination in Africa, what does it have to do with the achievement of the 2030 goals? And how does it relate to Africa agenda 2063? Because we feel that, you know, if we talk about higher education, academic publishing and dissemination, it has to, uh, you know, make a contribution into the kind of sovereignty that is initiated in uh, agenda 2063. Uh, thanks, come to you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Yes. Uh, I'll jump my, 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 my part of the presentation and I will invite Professor Kabiru Kinanjui uh, from Kenya. 
uh, he is coordinating the professionalization of the academia. Uh, is Prof. Uh, Kabir around? Yes, he is. Perfect, perfect. Good to see you, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you, the facilitator, and thank you, all of you. And I wish you a good day, wherever you are. What has been said earlier affirms the critical role um, that um, academic profession plays in the realization of key functions of universities and higher education in Africa. That is teaching, research, and public service. Academic professions are critical in moving the quality of education or what um, Dr. Mateta has said, the quality of graduatedness in, uh, in our universities. And we have seen that this is the cadre which is very critical to research productivity. And more recently we have seen it is people from the academia who have contributed in helping governments on the region in this continent to be able to formulate policies related to COVID-19 um, pandemic. And they are also the ones really shaping the dialogue on climate change and sustainable development. But these people, um, profession, professionals are working in a context which uh, is very constraining and which is actually impact on their output. The first thing to note is that with the growth of institutions, enrollments, and also increased programs of the universities, this have affected the way the professionals work. They have become um, thinly spread in the various institutions. And we have also seen this growth has not been um, accompanied by increased input and investments in building the academic profession. So we are also seeing underfunding of the university from the state and lack of diversification of resources, sources for universities. The COVID-19 pandemic has also brought in the forefront the situation in our universities and the academic profession in particular. They have compounded the situation. We have seen the infrastructure, weakness of infrastructure and teaching and learning environment. And we have also seen that they, they don't have the skills to cope with the online uh, learning. So what we are seeing at this moment is um, overloaded uh, um, professionals, in particularly in teaching, and teaching which is being done with the uh, professionals who have only master's degrees. And we are seeing increasing use of part-time uh, part uh, uh, teachers because funds are not available to employ all those who, who are needed in, the, in these institutions. And so we are also seeing professional development and mentorship is very much neglected in the development of the profession. On the other hand, we are also seeing the bright and uh, the brightest students and who are qualified are refusing to see the academic uh, profession as their destination. And overall, we are seeing, instead of professionalization, we are seeing unionization and increasing confrontation of unions uh, and the, the administration and also the government. What uh, is to be done? I think it is very critical to be able to look at the crisis and resilience of the academic profession. And we have to look by doing the study. And I suggest uh, we had to take four or five case studies taking consideration regional diverse, diversities and complexities so that we can be able to see what is happening on the ground. And this will help us and inform dialogue 
and research um, recommendations on policy, which can be able to help universities, help the governments, help regional bodies and development partners, including um, private sector and unions to come with the way, way forward. We are also um, noting- Prof. Kabiru, that, uh, I want you to wrap up. Yes, we are also noting the necessity of negotiating at this moment of where this kind of a project could be located in a number of uh, universities in the, re in the region so that we can be able to formulate research actions and plans which can be able to strengthen the, the academic profession, which is critical to advancing the university mission and agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Kinyanju. Uh, what, uh, you know, in the next uh, presentation, uh, would, I would give an opportunity to uh, uh, UNESCO to share with us uh, a, a presentation. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, I'll give them three minutes, three minutes to speak to the, the topic. Uh, that would be Dr. Salifu, is that right? Can we hear Mr. Salifu? Yes, of course. Can you hear me, Professor? Yes. Okay, yes. let me. Mr. Mr. Salifu? My... Mr. Yes. Salifu? Can yes. you hear me? I can hear you loudly. Very good. Uh, you based in Senegal, right? You no, know, uh, yes, you know, I am based in Abuja, Abuja Regional Office. Okay, great. So, uh, what yeah. uh, so we give you three minutes to give us a key highlight, a key highlight of your presentation, and then put the link to the audience on the, the material you are presenting. May you please. Okay, thank you. I want first of all uh, to thank sincerely the SG of AAU uh, for, and you also for giving me this opportunity to share uh, a very important outcome of the first meeting of Addis Ababa Convention. As uh, you know, Addis uh, Convention entered into force in December 2019. And due to COVID-19, we were obliged to postpone the organization of the first implementation meeting. Because first of all, when the, at this convention in time to force, we need to implement now the convention. And hopefully in December, 2021, despite the spread of Omicron, we succeed to organize this activity. And uh, let's say quickly that the objective of the first meeting is, first of all, to strengthen regional cooperation, quality assurance, and academic mobility in Africa through the implementation of this convention. And the two main outcomes is, first, we put in place the bureau of this committee, the bureau of this committee for the two upcoming years is the his figure is like this. First, the Togo is the president of this convention. The, the Togo hosts the event and all the statement party has elected Togo as president. We have two vice presidents, Gambia and Congo Brazzaville, and Mauritius as rapporteur. The second outcome of this meeting is that the Addis Convention Committee set up a roadmap for the two upcoming years that we can, let's say, evaluate, assess. The first point, okay, is that all the participants reiterate their commitment to implement Addis Convention in order to strengthen academic record recognition, mobility, and inter-university cooperation among the countries, giving particular attention to regular operation of quality assurance mechanism 
which should be empowered to carry out specific evaluation of higher education. Secondly, they underline the importance of inclusion in higher education and reaffirm the determination to establish appropriate procedures and tools to assess how refugees and internally displaced persons can respectfully, respectively full relevant requirement to assess higher education and employment, full recognition, and so on. Third point, they agree on the need to set up an African network of national implementation structure, including information center, which is key to the effective implementation of this convention and promote sharing of information and mutual understanding and transparency between education system. Secondly, they invite themselves to nominate the focal point for this convention information centers. Point four, they also invite the bureau to explore the possibility of monitoring or publishing a kind of the report on, on the implementation of Addis Ababa Convention. Now, at the end, they encourage, let's say they encourage all the state party and all the African countries to ratify Addis Convention, but also the, the invite all the member states to ratify the global convention of UNESCO regarding the recognition of qualification in higher education. I want to thank sincerely the SG of AAU that do a very relevant presentation on Addis Ababa Convention, particularly its implementation in COVID-19 period. How Addis Ababa Convention can help during this period. Thank I you will be much. very brief. Thank you very I, much. I, at your disposal for any additional information. I will also share the link so that all the participants can get this information. Thank okay. you, uh, Mr. Salifu, very much. We gave you three minutes, you used uh, five minutes, but we can oh. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, what uh, I'm supposed to be talking around leadership and management, but I decided not to engage uh, that conversation but today because of some changes we are uh, uh, considering uh, with regard to the kind of arrangements that need to happen and so forth. So I'll simply pass for now. What I'm going to do now is I will, I'm not gonna for sure uh, summarize the, the presentations, but simply key highlights on that, two, three minutes, and I'll hand it to Professor Oyewole for the discussion part along the themes which we already identified in the programs. The couple of things came up in this. Uh, in terms of the, the book projects, we spoke, uh, five of them. Uh, that is uh, happening through the uh, AU-EU partnership initiative within the HAQA uh, framework. So we would like to acknowledge that. Uh, so we, in fact, as you saw, one book is uh, pretty good, uh, you know, probably in the next several months, uh, you know, we should be able to, to uh, at least put it in, 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 into print. Uh, others are also coming. I think two points raised here. One, uh, as uh, Dr. Vilate intimated, as well as uh, uh, Professor Oanda, in terms of uh, still, uh, you know, recruiting contributors. So I hope some of you have uh, listen to this uh, conversations. You can actually go to the website. I will post it on uh, on on this link on the link here, where you can actually find the topics uh, and and uh, the the book chapters right there. So if you are interested, you can uh, you can get in touch with two of, two, two of these individuals or myself. Uh, so that's number one. And number two. Uh, I also wanted to share with you an upcoming event, which uh, uh, Professor Wanderson intimated earlier uh, about uh, the upcoming 
initiative which will be organized in April in Addis Ababa, uh, late April, uh, to be exact, uh, I think the last week of April, on what we call uh, HEFALA, the Higher Education Forum for Africa, Asia, and Latin America, uh, uh, the third, uh, the, you know, third, uh, the third HEFALA conference. And this is a partnership between the St. Mary's University, of course, Association of African Universities, under the stewardship of the African uh, Union Commission. So these are, these are the, the issues which I wanted to indicate uh, before I hand in uh, the, uh, this, uh, the, the platform to Professor Oyole. Uh, I think we are good on time. So I will hand it over to Prof. Oyole uh, for the next part uh, and make sure that I'll also keep the time. And thank you uh, for all of you for the presentation but I hope you will stay uh, in the discussion. And, and, and I now, uh, once that discussion uh, opens up, uh, we'll uh, take questions and comments and feedback on the chat. Uh, uh, and also, given the time, we'll also uh, uh, ask people to participate. Uh, Professor Royole, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Damtu Tefera. I want to appreciate all the speakers that have made contribution to this discussion today. I want to draw attention to a comment made by Professor Jagede during his presentation. He said, CESA is from 216 to 2022 and to 2025. And right now we're in 2022, just three years to go. One thing the pandemic has taught us is that it is time that we change our thinking and we change our approach to things in Africa. For CESA objectives to be achieved, we need consultations just like the one we are doing right now. One other thing that we need to drive CESA is to develop appropriate data-driven policies that can help our higher education to be where it's supposed to be. You may be wondering why we are having this consultation today. The consultation we are having right now is towards, is part of our contributions towards the EU African Summit that is coming up next week, uh, in two weeks time. I need to note that this is what we are doing on the African side. On the European side, led by the Obrek Global, there is a pre-summit consultation that is also going on, and I believe that the link to that has been put forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's high time. Another reason why we are putting up this consultation today is because we need to determine the future of higher education in Africa. I want every one of us to know that the African Union is listening to what we are, we are discussing now. What is going to be the future of higher education in Africa? But more importantly, not just to higher education institutions alone, but to the African Union. How can the message of CESA be moved on the political platform to the universities, to the professors, to the students who need to be the primary implementers of CESA? I believe that this type of consultation that we are doing today is something that our vice chancellors, our professors, and all the higher education practitioners, all the stakeholders in higher education, we take note of. Ladies and gentlemen, what is going to be the future of higher education in Africa? There are some issues that we need to mention. I believe that in the course of this discussion, Somebody has mentioned that funding is an issue that we need to address. You can imagine all the clusters being challenged with the issue of funding. What, how can we handle the issue of funding in moving higher education policies in Africa? We want to hear from you. There are other issues that has come up. Digitalization, digitalization. What our digitalization needs in African higher education system? What can we do to build up the infrastructures? 
the capacities of the academics, the capacities of the students to be able to connect to digitalization. How can we ensure the quality of teaching and learning through digitalization? I know that in many places, people are already talking about challenges of digitalization to higher education. They've been talking about the loss of jobs by academics, loss of critical thinking among our students, and cases of academic frauds coming in through digitalization. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open for us to discuss these issues that will determine the future of higher education in Africa. But before we look at these issues and we discuss them, permit me to make an important uh, announcement about an event that is coming up in Kenya in some days time. It's a, and I will want you to take note of this. From all that has transpired today and moving forward, we have realized the accurate task responsibilities on our shoulders as institutions or researchers. I know that there are many vice chancellors on this platform now. Indeed, we need to let our vice chancellors, our professors know that they are the main implementers of CESA 1625 agenda. You are the vehicle that we facilitate the achievements of this agenda. And I want us to know that one of our various, one of the vehicles through which this agenda can be achieved is through our various national research and educational networks. As higher education institutions, we are the major players in our national research and educational networks in rents. I am at this particular time inviting our vice chancellors to find time within your busy schedules to attend that meeting that we have called for 21st to 22nd of February at the Longview Suits, Nairobi, Kenya, to discuss how we can strengthen our inrents so that the inrents in turn can provide critical ICT infrastructures and services that will support research, teaching, and learning towards the mission of CESA 1625. Please, we have sent the invitation to all our vice chancellors, and I want you to look at the invitation again and key into it. Ladies and gentlemen, what does the future hold for higher education? In terms of funding for higher education, not just on the continental level, but at the institutional level. What are the challenges of digitalization? And after we discuss these two matters, I will take us to the next level of looking at the African credit system in Africa, similar to what Dr. Salifu had mentioned. And then how can we ensure internal and external quality assurance in our institutions? The floor is now open for contributors. If you want to make contributions, just raise up your hand and you will be unmuted for you to be able to sleep, to speak. Thank you. I can see Professor Goski Alabi and then followed by Abiodun Akindele. Can we unmute Professor Goski Alabi to make a contribution? Over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Oyawili. And we'd like to once again congratulate you for this great job done. Um, you said it all, digitalization ought to be prioritized in Africa because it is the new normal and situations are not going to change. And so the question is, how do we move forward, particularly with the issues of ensuring that our end runs take center stage? I think that with respect to the um, quality issues, the ACDE will be very happy to work with the AAU in particular, the, um, the Nigerian regulatory authorities, which are hosting the quality assurance um, units of the ACDE at the moment, the Nigerian Open University as well, 
to ensure that we collectively work with the AAU to move this agenda forward. Of course, the end runs um, are supposed to be well equipped by Afran through their regional networks. And so they are doing a lot already and we call on them together with the AAU and ACBE to reach out to the national authorities and make this a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Goske Alabi. We, uh, we always appreciate your contributions every time. I can see Dr. Abiyadu Akindele. Can we unmute him? Uh, Dr. Salifu, Why? one of them. Yeah. Hello. Introduce yourself and where you are you are located. Thank you very much. I am Abiodu Akinele. I am a, a principal assistant registrar in the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan. Yes, uh, the discussion is very, very robust. And I think my own contribution is this. Have we been able to integrate university professional administrators and uh, ICT experts, research administrators as well, as well as technologies in the CISA 2025, because if all the training are going into academia, but we are not able to train those people that are going to implement some of these programs at the grassroots, it's may want to be a failure. That is my own contribution. What are the roles that we have identified for ICT expert, university professional administrators, research administrators, as well as technology, as well as technologies in the CISA 2025? Thank you. Just to provide a quick answer, I'm just about four months old as the Secretary General of AAU. Within these past three months, I've requested for the database of university registrars in African universities. We have also compiled a database of the ICT experts in African universities. We are in the process of compiling a database of technologies. We recognize the important roles that these professionals have to play in CESA. Within the next few weeks and months, we are going to call them to some consultation meetings we are going to be able to discuss their roles. Thank you, Mr. Abiyodun Akindele. I want you to know that CESA is not just about the teaching staff. The role of the administrators is very important in the achievement of the objectives of CESA. Thank you. Professor, uh, Dr. Sagamifu, you, you, you have the floor. OK, thank you very much, SGAAU, for the good job you are doing since uh, you are the head of the AAU. Let me tell you that the issue of the future of higher education is very core for UNESCO. As you may know, UNESCO launched three, two years ago, let's say three years ago, a new initiative, the future of education. Inside the future of education, we have the future of higher education. That's why we support AAU in organizing the first meeting on the future of higher education in Africa. The next upcoming third World Conference on Higher Education will be the great occasion to talk about the future of education and Africa as a whole uh, continent. And our expert can come on board and explain what will be the future of research, teaching, learning of higher education. Let's say, Recall the main topics of this conference. Impact of COVID-19 on higher education, higher education and SDGs, inclusion in higher education, quality and relevance of programs, academic mobility in higher education, higher education governance, financing higher education as you have said earlier, data and knowledge production. You put more emphasis on this, we will come or not. International cooperation and enhanced synergies. The future of higher education. Let's say that the third conference on higher education is a conference for experts 
So UNESCO increased the number of the participants. If you want to participate, I know that UNESCO headquarters will send a letter to a, a, a African Union, to all the a regional economic community, but also to AAU. We had the opportunity to come with content and participate online. Physically, there is a possibility for UNESCO to cover, let's say, the uh, transportation and accommodation of the less developed countries, one per country. But you need to get in touch with the SG NATCOM of your country to know how it will work. But regarding the international organization, it's clear they will contact AAU, they will contact AU, they will contact was and so on, African Vacation Qualification Network, ECOA, and so on. So that's what I want to recall. Do not forget, the third conference will be held in Barcelona from 18 to 20 May 2022. We have shared the, this conference for last year. Because of COVID, we were obliged to shift it to this year. So thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Salifu. And just to note that the, Africa, the EU Africa Summit is holding in the next two weeks. And after that summit, AAU is going to lead a conversation on the post EU Africa Summit discussion. And I'm inviting all the regional, intra regional uh, higher education uh, organizations to be part of this discussion. Thank you. Salam Zato. Salam Zato. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Salam Janto from uh, UCC, that is the African Center of Excellence in Coastal Resilience. And thank you very much for the invitation for this workshop. And what I feel about having um, to put Africa on the higher mark in terms of education has to do more with moving away from the theory-based learning to a more practical one. That is, it's high time we look at how we kind of put into practice every single thing that we learn in the classroom, especially when we are looking at it in terms of the thought works that we do. And also you spoke about uh, funding. I believe that in order to get funding, it has to do with how well is your work known there. And this goes ahead to look at publications. That is looking at um, how you publish. What is the data that is sitting on our computers? I believe that each and every one of us here has a lot of data. But how well do we publish this data? It is through these publications that when we write for funders, for um any other project that we want to take in Africa, it is easier for us to get these funding. So we need to look at how well we publish and also moving away from theory-based learning to a more practical one. Thank you. I want to thank you for sure the system of teaching and learning must change in Africa. Ibrahim Amido. Can you unmute yourself, Ibrahim Amido? Okay, there we go. I would like to thank each and every one of you for inviting us for this meeting uh, to exchange ideas. And uh, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, the sister who just uh, spoke her, you know, before me, she addressed the issue of uh, funding. And I would like to touch base, you know, on that. Uh, my, my thinking is that uh, out of ignorance, do we have some kind of a PR department with the AU? Uh, I think uh, this is this will be good if we don't have one to have one, which will kind of work with uh, public and private, uh, uh, you know, entities, and uh, introduce and present uh, AU and its function uh, within the African continent and its internalization, uh, and that will allow them to kind of uh, put together all the data that uh, the sister just mentioned. That's one thing. The other thing also is uh, uh, for us, for African universities to kind of uh, uh, function, uh, you know, there need to be uh, a, an understanding among themselves and then network closely. There should be uh, accountability and results. 
And I believe that's what uh, the sister also mentioned indirectly when she mentioned about publishing what we're doing. So we have to be able to kind of uh, present to the world what we are producing so that we are accounted for and then there's trust because it's a trust, you know, the, the trust is very important in anything that we undertake and funding is crucial to be able to move forward. And I think that uh, uh, Abdullahi uh, Salifu also mentioned the opportunity that UNESCO has. So if there's that front, we're able to put together a unified front with uh, the international institutions, funding, it makes it a lot easier. But I think the PR department is qualified to do that job. That's where we need to focus on if we don't have any. But if we have one, we need to reinforce its, its work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Also, as a way of information, just last week, AAU was involved in a discussion with the private sector on the, the setting up of the African Education Trust Fund. Very soon, we shall give you more information about this trust fund. AAU is collaborating with the private sector for the development of higher education in Africa. I will want to call upon Shano Omabari. Let, let, me, let, me, after that. let me jump in, uh, Prof. Here. I think it may be relevant, it may be relevant to share uh, that AAU has its own TV uh, programs where we actually carry some of the activities. So that actually goes by way of a PR. I just wanted to intervene there. Thank you, uh, Prof. Yuwale. Thank you very much. Chano Omabari. <clears throat> yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. One minute, please, one minute. Yes, a quick one. Actually, uh, let, let me just take the opportunity to congratulate you. I never had the opportunity, but hopefully we'll meet in two weeks' time. Now, um, I'm from the Gambia at the International Open University. Now, one issue that has always come up, basically, in most of the discussions I've had when it comes to really that harmonization uh, for higher education is the challenge of having recognition, is the recognition. Because the problem is that we want uh, our African universities to accept students across all universities. A graduate of my university is supposed to easily get access to other universities. As long as my university is accredited within my country, we have been having this challenge. And I think this is going to be one major uh, step if the AAU is able to support in ensuring that they coordinate that opportunity for universities and countries to be able to share uh, universities that have been recognized or are accredited in their countries. So that the students that are moving now across, uh, con the con at least within the continent, and who want to uh, register in any university within the continent should not have any challenge to register as long as their university is already within a database, either by uh, uh, established, uh, recognized at the level of AAU, or maybe uh, at any other database that the other universities can consult easily. I think this is going to be very helpful in the movement of our students within the continent. And that has been a challenge for us at, uh, at, at the Gambia here. And I'm hoping that this could be taken up seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that this is exactly the objective of the, at this convention. Unfortunately, as of today, only 14 countries in Africa had ratified that convention. There is a need for us as academics to talk to our governments on the need to ratify this convention. And very importantly, too, not many countries in Africa have national regulatory agencies for higher education in their countries. We need to see to the establishment of this so that this issue of recognition can be made easy. But beyond this, as academics, issues about credit is an item that we need to, to understand. One credit in West Africa may mean three hours of lecture over 14 weeks. It may not be the same thing in other parts of Africa. So as we move forward into the future of higher education in Africa, it's high time we agree on the issue of credits in, in understanding, appreciating the contents of our curricula. These are part of the things that we'll be looking at in the next few weeks or months. Please, I will just want to give us one minute each. Uh, I can see Michael Shuzua, Maxwell Gapo, and Professor Luke Bemiro Jagede for these three people to make their contributions before we go to the next level. Thank you. I am also seeing Mabel Ikwimo Moroti, four people. After that, we go to the next discussion. Thank you.
Joshua Michael, so have, yes, sir. Thank you very much. I'm Joshua Michael from the University of Ngawandere, Cameroon, Central Africa. Uh, uh, so I, I thank very much the AG for associating me in this uh, very important discussion as far as the future of uh, our university is concerned. Uh, since uh, many years already, we used to, we are working on uh, the, the topic of concern with uh, university and local development. I think it should be better to focus another aspect, another point on that, uh, on that aspect as far as the future of the university is concerned. The second contribution is that of uh, distance learning. Distance learning within a network of the university, all the university of Africa. Within that network, I think if we emphasize on distance learning, I think we will solve more, the, more than, um, we will solve the problem concerned with the mobility, the mobility of our, our students. So that is the two, those are the two uh, uh, aspects that I wish that we should emphasize on, uh, on it. I share one of our Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much, sir. Max Wagapo, it's your turn. Master Gakpo, yes, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, SG and the AAU team for organizing this meeting. Uh, my first uh, contribution is that, is there a cooperation framework or a cluster for regulators of higher education institutions in Africa where the AAU play a key uh, pivotal role in organizing and harmonizing all the frameworks and corporations that we have discussed today. Uh, on the backdrop that there is still a stigma on open and distance education in some private institutions by some public sector institutions. Uh, we need this cooperation framework and our cluster for regulators. And it is high time we practicalize some of the things we have discussed today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that your question or your concern will be addressed by Professor Jegede as a response now. Professor Jegede. Uh, th thank you very much, sir, for, um, for giving me that honor and for saying that I'll be responding to whatever they are saying. Yes, sir. Number one, we seem to be going back and forth. I know that almost 12 years ago, we were talking about the uh, recognition of, um, of our certificates or whatever across Africa. And two, we we're talking about how to move people, both students and staff across Africa and across many levels and credit transfers were talked about. We are still back to this same thing all over. I mean, why do we keep mm -hmm. going back and forth in Africa? Well, this is something we should have done. And unfortunately, the ratification of that convention will have solved this purpose. Again, 20, 30 years, only 14 governments in 54 governments of Africa have ratified it. Perhaps, honestly, unusual things demand unusual answers. Is there any way AAU can move us forward without showing that we are, we are reacting or whatever to our governments? Can we call their bluff? and let universities and high schools do what they are doing and forget about this government. Our government, our presidents are just there for political reasons. Many of them cannot even do anything. They are just there for their pockets and for their money. The other thing is that I will talk to, I, for open and distance learning in Africa, we have gone beyond what people are talking about now. When we started some 20 years ago, people said that, oh, uh, distance learning, we never have is, is foothold. Now, we have, 665,000 students at the National Open University in, in Nigeria. And people are asking for more. We have gone beyond all this, uh, all this stigmatization of whatever. We can do more, ask us the questions. Let them talk to us directly. And in any case, we have the African Council for Distance Education, open to all universities, open to all higher education institutions. We can do more. It has its own quality assurance agencies. It has got everything. Why? I mean, maybe because of the turnover of vice chancellors, people don't follow, and there's no handover of this. Please talk to me. As long as I am alive, 
talk to me, talk to others, talk to uh, Gosky, talk to ACDU. We can help out. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Can I now call on Mabel Ikwin Moroti, the last speaker, before we go to the next discussion? Good yes. afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I want to. Are you hearing me? We can hear you. Very I want well. to appreciate you very much for this uh, interaction. It's very timely. And I'm I think we are 500. Mm. Oh. I appreciate the last uh, speaker and the explanation that followed. My concern is is there any harmonization in our curriculum? Is there any harmonization for the various courses we are studying across African University? If there is, and how do we allocate the units like you mentioned? It's clean. Oh. Hello. Continue, man. Continue, I was muted. Okay. We can't hear you again. Somebody yeah, is muting. Uh, I was muted by, I don't know. Okay, so are you with me now? Okay. Very now, clear, the yes. issue of unit allocation, unit is indicative of the weight of the course that is taught. And, and I think, well, from my experience, it's like the, the units were just arbitrarily allocated, maybe based on what they think people need. For instance, in fisheries, if you feel aquaculture, maybe fish breeding is very important, they give it a high unit. Then maybe they feel bond construction is not as important. They give it lower units. I don't think that is how it should be. So I think there is need for us to sit down, to look at these courses, the ways they carry, and allocate appropriate units for each of them. I also wouldn't know if GNS is a common thing across African universities. GNS is almost 12 units. And it's taking so much time that uh, it's, it's, it's not giving enough space for the study of other core courses in each of the programs that we run. Yes, that's the end. Thank you very much. I'm grateful. Yes, let me just give room to Professor ADBC Balogun to make his contribution before we go to the next discussion. Yes, Professor ADBC Balogun. Can we unmute him? We sent a request to unmute himself. He has not. So let's carry okay. on. OK. I want to thank everyone that has made contributions. Can I make a, a, a seemingly uh, controversial? Yeah, Professor Balogun, over to you, sir. Can you unmute yourself, Professor Balogun? Yes. Um, yes. I've unmuted myself. So, yes, you can there's no you way now. you allocate arbitrary units. Units are allocated based on whether you have practical costs. If a cost is one unit, there are number of hours that it must take within a week and the number of weeks that it must take within the, the term. So there is nothing like that. The issue of our curriculum, NUC is trying to do a review of our curriculum where they review 70% and give 30% to the university. So where you are talking about GNS, GNS, it depends on the way you allocate your units to, use, to GNS. By the new curriculum, it will be easier for you, for any university, 30% of the units will be allocated to courses that Senate will have to approve. And therefore, within that particular realm, the Senate of each university will be able to control the number of units that will be allocated to Thank you very uh, much, sir. ANS and some other important courses for the university. Yeah. I think that yeah, I think you are you are talking in the context of Nigeria, 
what you are saying is that what is one unit in West Africa may not be one unit in North Africa. And it has made it difficult now to transfer credits from one university to another and move students to acquire knowledge in more than one place at a time. I hope that we'll get to that discussion. I will also draw our attention to some other issues in Africa now. One of the things that diaspora has taught us is that African universities can leverage on the academic diaspora for their development. It is high time we consider the possibility of having virtual diaspora, virtual academics in our various departments. They may not be resident physically in your country, but they can be where they are and still contribute to you and still supervise your students. We need to think about this. Then there is also the issue of the African quality rating mechanism. I'm sure that Professor Banner Jagger will say that this one has also been on since 2010, and we are still taking it, we are still yet to accept its operation. Please, ladies and gentlemen, in the next five minutes, are there some new issues that you think that African higher education need to commit themselves to for the future? Now, people are also talking about ranking. Nigerian universities are now doing ranking. Is this a priority for the future of African universities? People talk about uh, competencies of our graduates. What should be our emphasis? I will just give room for the next five minutes to people who want to make contributions before we round up this discussion. And I hand over to Professor Dantu. I can see Dr. Makuku's hand up. Can we unmute her for her to make a contribution? Dr. Makuku, one minute. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Prof, and thank you everyone for the event. Yes, I just want to make uh, two quick comments uh, on uh, uh, the harmonization. I think, Prof, uh, it's something that uh, people are worried about and that they want to happen. So uh, I realize that uh, people are not so much cognizant of the sister project of the Haka Initiative, which is the Tuning Africa. We had Tunica 1 and Tuning Africa 2. I just want people to write that down and go to the websites uh, and check what it is about. Uh, Zimbabwe is ahead in terms of uh, the harmonization prof that you are talking about at continental level, uh, that we can now have the credit units, a uh, common uh, knowledge, minimum board of knowledge. The second one, Prof, uh, is on um, graduate employability and um, uh, uh, employment generating skills. So for that one, the institutions need to have centers where they are taking this in, uh, as they go and in gloves. The graduate employability skills, as well as employment creation skills, we should impart this together to our graduates and not continue to armor on graduate employability alone. No, 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 no. That will not change the mindset which we want that other graduates should create jobs. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, because that those are the future of higher education in Africa. Professor Vincent Balogun, can we listen to you? Professor Vincent Balogun, then Professor Goski Alabi. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, I think uh, going forward in African education, we actually needed to do what, what I would call general curricular overhaul. We are doing courses in African universities that actually have no bearing you know, to the applications in the industry. It's quite unfortunate that we produce graduates that cannot be employed uh, in the industry. So what we could do is maybe a stakeholders meeting, you know, across African universities. Let them come together, sit down, bring in stakeholders from the industries. 
stakeholders from every areas of life tell us what is required. Of course, I'm in the academia. Uh, I do state university Uzawe in Nigeria. So tell us exactly what is required. What skills do you need for your your staff or your in, in the industry for them to to work with that company? Then we will now Thank embed you, that into what we have in, 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 the, in the academia, and then curricula will be developed, and then student uh, student can be employable. Particularly, it is important also that we do what we call the outcome based curricula. Curricula that, that will bring out outcomes as we develop them, so that student knows the outcome even before they graduate. That will be very thank you for, for, for the African continent. Thank you very much. Th thank you for your contributions, and also to know that our countries are looking up to our universities to see their contributions to helping countries to attain, I mean, meet up the demands of the SDGs. I will call on Professor Goski Alabi, please. Just one minute for Professor Goska Labi, Adebo, Akore, and George Chowofe. Just a minute. Okay. There is one called Techno Come On, but we don't know what the name is. So he is or she is ahead of the, the line. Yeah, Please but we don't know who on. the person is. Okay. I skipped okay. because I can't understand who the person is. Okay. Techno Come On, can you change your name so that we know who you are? Meanwhile, Gosia Labi, you can have the floor. Okay, thank you One very minute. much, Prof. Okay, so Prof, the first um, thing I want to talk about is the role of Afrikan in this whole process. And I was expecting a rep or to hear something from Afrikan today. But that is also to add to the question that Maxwell, Maxwell Kapo asked about whether there is a network of our regulatory bodies. Yes, it is Afrikan. The next thing I want to talk about is how do we manage data? I know that the AAU is trying oh. We've lost her. Uh? Yes. OK. Can Judge Towofe take over? Is it Judge or Adebo and Kori? Adebo and Kori. George Wofe, Shinwe Shukudi, let us Hello. meet any one of them, please. Okay, I'm on now. Okay, can you hear George me? Wofe. Right. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I just to add on to what others have said, I believe it's about time that there is collaboration between the industry and the academia. In that case, the investors can have access to industrial problems and find a way to solve them and that will bridge the gap between the industry and academia, and that will also offer our graduates the opportunity to be, to be absorbed into the industries when they graduate. The second point I want to make is that, as others have said, our curriculum in Africa is outdated in the sense that the curriculum is not able to develop employable skills among our graduates. Our graduates come out without employable skills, but if our curriculum is modified to include courses and subjects that can develop employable skills in our graduates, and also if our, 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 if our academic colleagues can adopt student-centered teaching and learning strategies, then that can help to develop employability skills in our graduates, and therefore that will make them employable. Either thank you, sir. Yeah. Government employee. Thank you. I, I have just about two minutes to go, and I will just give one minute to Chiwe Chukudi and one minute to Professor Jackede again, and then I will hand over to Professor Dampti Tafari. Chiwe Chukudi, can we unmute her? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, uh, very quickly, there are three things I wanted to raise. I'm talking about skills and employability. Um, there's a trend that is growing and is worrying me personally. And that is the trend of um, people who have extraordinary skills in Africa, who are, who are not getting the support they need. 
to develop their skills. And this is what I think would move Africa forward because we have, we, our, our educational system is based on this um, colonial um, system that we received, that we have not been able to fine tune to what we actually need. I've had the privilege of being trained in at least three continents of the world. And I see how they pick up skills from infancy. BBC has been showcasing a lot of people who have extraordinary skills. In the last one week, I have watched interesting movies from interesting documentaries from BBC about at least three Africans. One has developed a, a car from scrap materials. The other one has developed um, how to use um, electrical. I, I'm not into electronics. I'm, I'm a biological, I'm a life scientist. So how to use those two and, and, and to, to, to power televisions and, and cars. And Tesla had to, like, they started going after him. No, these are our own. Not going after him to take him, but going after him to silence him because he's a big threat to them. These are people, another one developed phantom car from, from one scrap engine. What is Africa doing to harness our own resources? If we don't, the West will always take them from us. And when they do, we keep crying foul. What are we doing to pick up these people? The, these three people I have mentioned have no formal education beyond secondary school. What are we doing to harness those resources? And that also goes that back is... to our, our, our being able to also reform, reform our, our curriculum to be able to, to develop skills that will help us move forward as a continent. It is not reading book that is important. It is being able to acquire skills. That's one. I Very want, quickly. I want you to know, time, I want you to know that the African Union is exactly interested in what you are saying. And these are the challenges that the continental education strategy for Africa is supposed to address. And it's high time we let those of us in the universities to know about this strategy. Please, I can see so many hands up, but I will just give one chance Thanks to Professor Jagadier to be the last person before Professor Dam to take over. I'm very sorry for others. Professor Jagadier, one minute, sir. Uh, Prof. Jagadier, we can't hear you. Prof. Jagadier, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, sir. We cannot hear you. you we cannot hear you, sir. You cannot hear me. Fine. Sir, now we can. Okay. Yes, you, you, you just wanted us to list the next area that um, Africa should be moving into our AAU. I will list them and later on send you a one page uh, concept note on them. One. Oh, that's we great, need, sir. We, we need to look at one, we need to look at the trend now is in the world is to look at soft skills training to prepare Africans for the future. That's number one. Number two, we want to look at lifelong learning trends in Africa so that no one is left behind. Three, we want to look at facilitating learning versus teaching. At the moment, our university teachers are still looking at teaching. Nobody or very few people are looking at, um, um, uh, looking learning. at learning, how to help students learn and own whatever they do. I will send you an expanded uh, this and about this. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Professor Damtu, over to you, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first of all check if uh, uh, Mr. Okonko is with us uh, as we are trying to wrap up uh, the event. We are, as you actually see, we are right on time. We are right on the ske uh, schedule. I want to maintain that. I still have ten, nine minutes to be exact. Uh, so what I'm actually asking, uh, anyone from AUC here now? Uh, is Mr. Nkonko here with us? I don't expect him to be with us because they have been working very hard for the last two years or th the last weeks, uh, welcoming the head of states in Addis Ababa, which, got co which, which was completed last last night. So, if if no, if I don't if I don't see anyone here, we still have uh, eight minutes, but I want to use the, uh, the time very effectively. So I will be opening the uh, floor for a, a couple of comments, a couple of comments. 
I specifically would invite people who have not spoken. And more so, I would actually would like to be uh, invite uh, women in this case. Uh, so I'll give uh, the, the opportunity for a woman here, right? I don't see any hands yet. Is Ganyu uh, a woman? If she is a woman, she can speak. Otherwise, she has or she has to she has to wait. I'm trying to unmute. Okay, Ganyu, are you a woman? No, I'm a maid. No, wait, wait then. Wait on the line. Uh, Violet Makuku. Violet, she already spoke earlier, so I want to give it. I won't give it to her. If there are no women who is, uh, and people who have not spoken, I'll give it to Ganyu Bello. Ganyu, I'll give you 45 seconds. I'll give you 45 seconds. Carry on. Carry on. Can you unmute yourself, Ganyu Bello? Yeah, I'm trying to. Okay, I, I have done okay. that. 45 can seconds. Can okay. yes, yes, you hear me now? Yes, I said I totally agree with Degede that we need soft skill in our curriculum. I also want to stress the fact that academicians in the African university need to have uh, knowledge and skill in pedagogy. Because whatever curriculum review we put in place, including the existing one, without that skill in teaching, teaching skill, pedagogic skills, it might okay. be difficult to ensure, to enhance meaningful learning. So your point is well, a, your, your point. Your point is well taken. That is pedagogy. Another point, yes. Mr. Ganyu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a, a very important intervention. I appreciate that, Fred. Fred. Fred, I unmute yourself. I, I give yes. Carry on. Fred, carry on. I can't hear you, Mr. Fred, so I give you the opportunity. Okay, I'll give a chance to Mr. or Mrs. Cosmas. Cosmas, unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much. The discussion is very interesting, but uh, one important thing in Africa that we have forgotten is that uh, when one comes with the innovation, what comes is like a punishment. Why? Because they are not supported at all. We can see we ourselves as academicians in Africa. Once your car gets broken, when you go for a mechanic, you will not ask the certificate. But when it comes to employment, the challenge is, uh, is you have to show certificates. I think if African, we want to go very fast. We need now also to see the employment, to change the employment acts that we have that require certificates more than the skills. For example, myself, I'm facing a challenge. I'm training people with disabilities. Can they have a lot of skills, but when they come for employment, they say, please show us a certificate, a secondary, how much you passed. Not okay. the skills. Thank now we you. need to change in place than the certificates. I got the point. I got the point. Employment Act for skills. I got the point. Thank you very much. Yes, okay. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I, is Mary Gor Goretti Otiano? Thank Mary you. Thank you. Thank you. Carry Thank on. you, Prof. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I'm Mary Greta Kinyi from University of Nairobi, Kenya. I'm uh, proposing that in our revised curriculum, our courses, let us include industrial attachment. In all the courses we do, let us have attachment so that the students have hands on in what they are learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, those people who have not spoken, uh, I see a, a call. Prof. Dam, there's also perpetual since you are looking for women. 
Yeah, I, I, I remember she spoke already. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rako? I'm a female. I'm not a, uh, oh, I'm not right. a man. I'm a, I'm a woman. Okay, Thank you great. so much. I've been listening for a very long time, but I just wanted to put this across, agreeing with one of the professors, that I think the best way to go in university education is to embark on the skills. And how do we do this? Most of the times, we do not have the resources, the practical materials to be used to, to enhance skills development with the students. That's why our students go out and they are failing to actually practice what we give them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pra yeah, practical skills need re uh, resources, instruments, and tools. Very well uh, uh, to take it. Uh, the next, Kababel Babbega. Mr. Kibabo, us uh, carry on. Carry on, Mr. Kibabo. Okay. okay, hello. Carry on. Hello. Carry on. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Just uh, my name is Kibabo Babagi from Tabri Dahar University, one of Ethiopian public university. Just uh, the only thing that is what I give and emphasize or focus on the area of four things, which is basically raised by previous participants. Uh, the first one is, the issue is harmonization of the curriculum, yeah? As uh, the concept of internationalization, curriculum harmonization is the basic issue without okay. curriculum. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kababa, do not go into uh, analyzing what you want okay. to say. Okay. Just okay. give us the points. Okay, okay. Only I give the point. The first one is harmonization of the curriculum. The second one is program relevance, the importance of the program, which is launched by the university. The third one is common workshop. It should be for all university. The first, the fourth one is common data storage site for all university for better communication. Thank you very much, Prof. Very important points, uh, which does not even need any elaboration. Uh, some of them already discussed. So with that, uh, Prof, excuse yes. me, Prof. Perpetua yes. Aliguara has been trying to speak. Thank okay. you. All right. Yes, Perpetua. Perpetua, ask. Yeah, I've asked you to unmute. Yes, carry on. Hello. Yes. Carry Good on. afternoon to everyone. Hello. Perpetua. Yes. Hello. Yes, we hear you loud and clear. We can hear you. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I posted a question in the chat. My question there is, is there any cause or discipline that is not important? Is the problem the cause or the planning or the curriculum? What is actually the problem? If there are, there are causes, uh, disciplines that are not important. Why do we still leave them in our universities? And then what, what we actually need is to find out all the, all the nations that are equally doing the same courses, find out how they do it. We can equally make it to be lively by practicalizing most of the things there so that everybody doing whichever course will be useful to our society, to Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, all right. What I'm going to do, I will, there is uh, Teresa. Let me give that uh, the next one to Teresa, and I will be concluding, but I will all pro uh, pro uh, probably consider Violet. Carry on, uh, Ms. Teresa. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much, Prof. Professor. I'm, I am Teresa Etu from National Open University of Nigeria. I have a concern about how to help the learners engage in the learning context, especially with the technology enhanced learning that is required in ODL. Knowing fully well that most learners 
are not technologically aware and the facilities are not even there. And then there are a lot of concepts in our curriculum that learners need to be helped to understand how to engage themselves in this learning um, experiences. And that requires a lot of guidance and the importance of engaging guidance counselors in our various higher institutions is just is one of the points I would like us to look into. Many of the institutions of higher learning, higher educational uh, learning in, in, the, in Africa do not engage counselors well effectively. Noted. Well noted. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that, Ms. Teresa. Uh, 30 seconds, okay. 30 seconds to Dr. Violet Makuku. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, Dr. Makuku. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, so first of all, I want to say the Association of African Universities offers a number of workshops uh, cognizant of some of the challenges that have been raised, including higher education, learner-centered teaching skills, which are so much needed to make sure that those who do not have the uh, uh, teaching background can be supported. There are many more in research quality assurance. I also want to say maybe in the next episodes, we can take um, the other webinars which go around teaching skills, others around research and so on. Because the uh, quality assurance was not really handled here. And uh, it's uh, something which we need also to give adequate space in order to make things ha ha happen. In the curriculum, one of the most important things institutions should do now is to say any discipline, any course offered in the institution should have its own ICT component because okay. um, industry, okay. yes, okay. if uh, okay. automated, and Dr. so they Marcus. work no way if they don't have that component. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Right, I think we covered a lot of ground. Uh, we heard uh, from different stakeholders, uh, academics, uh, leaders, uh, researchers, and I think there is, there is you know, clear signal about the revitalization of African higher education in the context of uh, the world we find ourselves in. Uh, you know, we've talked about this revitalization 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. We are talking about still the revitalization of African higher education. I think COVID, whatever, um, the, you know, advantages we've had, uh, COVID has simply uh, stolen. So I think we are not yet again looking at advancing Af African higher education. And that requires a lot of engagement and partnership. And that partnership means that we as Africans take the leadership and ownership of the conversation and the dialogue. And AAU uh, as an umbrella organization uh, would be taking that lead uh, under the new secretary general. Uh, and also uh, we have also a new president of the Association of African Universities. With, that, with those uh, comments, I will be inviting Professor Olushola Oyeole for parting words. Thank you all on my part, and I will hand it back to I will, I will hand it to Professor Oyeole. Thank you, Professor Damchu. If I could interrupt, we would like to take a picture before we exit. If that could, we could have a minute or so to do that. Thank you. Most certainly, yeah. but I think you should be able. We should, you should now <laughs> let people to turn their videos on. So let every one of us put on All our videos. You. Thank you very much. Are we still on? Madam Oduma, we can't see Just you. Just a second. Just a second. We don't see her yet. I think we have about 10 pages. That's why you, you don't see. We are about Let's move the mask. Yes, uh, we don't see Cosmas. Still, uh, I'm still asking to, to turn the video on. 
Let's turn the uh, video on, please. Okay, I think what they can do is they can shoot a different uh, pages. Okay, I think is that is done. Is it done, uh, Miss Noduma? Yes, yeah. we, we've done our best. Thank you. But okay. people Thank can very keep much. their videos on. Thank you. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Professor Oyewole. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just note, I hope I'm correct, that at a height in the course of this discussion, we have 274 people on the platform. And now that we are concluding, we have about 222 people on this platform. I want to thank every one of us that have made contributions. And you may be wondering, where do we go from here? I've discussed with Professor Damtu. He's going to write a report on this discussion that's going to be, to be published for wide circulation so that people know the thoughts of African academics about the future of higher education in Africa. To also let you know that we believe that this input will also be useful to the African Union Commission as they go into the EU Africa Summit in the next two weeks. And I've also promised you that the Association of African Universities is going to call for a stakeholders meeting on the post summit, this, the Association of African Universities is committed to higher education in Africa. I did not welcome formally Professor Damtu to AAU in this audience, but to let you know that Professor Damtu Tafera is the new director for research and academic, plan, academic planning in the Association of African Universities. I want to know that with him, Madam Nodumo, uh, and every other directors in AU, we are committed to the advancement of higher education in Africa. We want to thank you for participating. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, and thank you all uh, presenters uh, and, uh, and participants for your comments and feedback. If we didn't, I mean, if we didn't take your comments or questions because time was not on our side, but also, as you know very well, you know, we sit on these meetings all day long and we meet, must finish meetings on time. We are already late by 10 minutes when we apologize for that. And thank you all and goodbye. Thank you, bye. Hey, so this is Dishan from Unica University Common Application. I recommend you to watch AAU television. AAU TV is the place to be for every person in higher education in Africa. Better be there or be nowhere. Continue to watch the la TV and surtout sur le AAU. Keep watching it and it will change the way you interact with higher education on the continent. AAU, great job. I want to tell you that AAU television is fantastic. It's educative, it's informative, and it is a must for anybody who is interested in higher education in Africa. When I was in Accra last year, I did an interview on this TV. It's a very important mouthpiece. It's a data, it's, it's a bank of all we need for the development of higher education in Africa. People should make an effort to view it because it discusses very current issues of development across the continent. I believe that the station will continue to promote the overall development of Africa, particularly in the tertiary education sector. AAU TV provides a platform and shares a lot of information to a broader audience. So we wish you all the best and please continue serving. AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa.